Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Shalina, and I'm happy to be here with you today. Those of you who are uh, here in person, those of you who are joining us online, um, there's a special day that's happening today. So before we come to the scriptures, we want to honor uh, today as Mother's Day. Um, today is all about celebrating our mothers, those who have been the hands and feet of Jesus to their children by birth, by adoption, by fostering, by choice. And so may you moms of all kind know that you are loved and valued. You are seen by this community, that your expressions and sacrifices of care and love and selfless service all count, all of them, big and small. They're signs of the kingdom, demonstrations of Christ-likeness, and reflections of the mother heart of God. Every tear wiped away, every whispered comfort, every tender act of care is needed by us, by the community, to remind us of our humanity and to show us what love looks like. We need you. We want you. Today, there are also realities of relationships that have been fractured, and there is pain in this room for unresolved conflict or tension, unmet expectations, or maybe loss. There's lots of loss represented in this room. Some have lost children. Some have lost mothers. My earring. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Some grapple with the loss of children never born, mothers never met. And so we come to the God who can hold our gratitude right alongside our lament and our questions. So let's pray together. Jesus, will you come and meet us in all of the places of sorrow that this day represents and pour out your spirit of comfort? Thank you for being the one who suffers with us and shares tears with us. Hold us in our emptiness or our anger or sadness. Presence yourself with each person here who finds Mother's Day difficult. And God, we also come with praise and thanksgiving for all the ways we have been blessed by our mothers and our mother figures. Bless them in Jesus' name with fullness of life. Where they have poured themselves out for the sake of others, would you fill them today to overflowing? Would you restore energy and hope and joy and peace for those who are weary? And Spirit, would you open their eyes to see how you are using their love and their sacrifice for good and how the things that have been done in secret are actually so precious to you, Jesus. Come and restore broken identities, renew relationships, and fill empty and weary places today, O oh God. We bless our mothers. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, these uh, past few weeks, we've been returning to the passage in Luke that was read for us by Carol. And we've been slowing down line by line to uncover the significance of all that was happening that Sabbath day when Jesus returned to his hometown and proclaimed an incredible message of grace in the synagogue. And he was met with a surprising, surprisingly violent rejection from the crowd of people. This crowd in Nazareth who had known him as a boy and were now completely unprepared for his bold claims that were just the beginning of Jesus' unraveling of a religious system and a fulfilling of centuries of prophecy and expectation around God's relationship with Israel and his intention to form a people from all nations. It was a salvation and restoration, divine grace that would no longer recognize socially or religiously determined boundaries. Jesus had come in the power of the Spirit to open the way for all people to come into relationship with God and to open up the promise that had been made to Israel. So we've been staying specifically with verse 18, his reading from Isaiah 61, that ends very intentionally with, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
before Jesus gets to and the day of vengeance of our God that everyone in the room would have been expecting and started mindlessly reciting and murmuring by memory and familiarity, he rolls up the scroll and he sits down and he tells the shocked and quiet room, all looking at him, eyes fastened. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Not the day of vengeance like you're expecting and, and hoping for. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, period. That is what I have come to do. That is the fulfillment of all you have heard about the Messiah that is to come. And I am him. I am here. I am with you and among you. And the crowd is furious. They're disoriented, confused. They want to kill him, drive him off of a cliff. And Wade is going to bring this home for us next week and remind us why it was so upsetting to them that day and what was going on as they brought him to the edge of a hill to throw him off a cliff. But today we're stopping where Jesus stopped. <laughs> the year of the Lord's favor. So what is this? Both in Isaiah's day and in Jesus' day, the year of the Lord's favor was not an unknown thing. Did you guys know that 2024 is the international year of the camelids? Yes. Anyone else need to Google what a camelid is? I had to do that. The UN has declared 2024 is the international year of the camelid, which is apparently alpacas and llamas and guanacos and dromedaries and lots of other things that I don't know. So this is a fact you're leaving with today. The year of the Lord's favor was not so obscure. Everyone knew what it was. It was embedded in Israel's collective memory and culture. It finds its roots all the way back in the book of Leviticus as a sort of super, super Sabbath. And it was known as the year of Jubilee. To understand the year of Jubilee, we need to understand the sabbatical year. So every seventh year, Israel was instructed in the law to leave the land fallow or to rest the land, to not sow it, reap it, not even prune it. And this represented a temporary restoration of the land back to what it was in the garden in Eden. And then every seventh sabbatical year, so for those of you good at math, every 49th year, or 50 years, depending on how you calculate it, Israel was instructed to sound the trumpet on the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the year, to usher in this year of Jubilee. And this very special sabbatical year had two additional provisions from a regular sabbatical year. One, the ancestral land that had been lost by way of debt was to be restored to the original family line, given back. And two, individuals and families that had been forced to bond themselves to further deaths, they were to be released from their bondage. They were to be released that year. All of their debts canceled. And the point of Jubilee was twofold. There were two things that God was um, preparing this instruction for to shape the heart of his people. One was to remember that the land belonged to no one but Yahweh that they were all just tenants, favored and chosen to live on the land by God's grace and mercy. And two, they were to remember that the Israelites were not to belong to one another. They were servants of Yahweh, and they belonged to him alone. And they had been redeemed and liberated from their captivity in Egypt, and they were not to return, at least not in the long term, to being slaves. A scholar of Jubilee and Old Testament law uh, wrote this. By reversing the conditions of slavery and loss of land, Jubilee was designed to signify the return of cosmic order to Israel. In this way, every 50 years, every generation, no matter how far they had wandered from their covenant with God and gotten themselves into a mess with the land or with one another, or with their socioeconomic system, their culture, every generation gets a restart of favor and an opportunity to live with fresh intention into their covenantal relationship with God. 
And that had started as God's promise to Abraham that this family, this nation, would be blessed or favored to be a blessing to the rest of the world. So now I've used this word a couple of times, favor. And we've read it's the year of the Lord's favor. So what, what is this word? What does it mean? Favor is the tangible evidence of God's approval and blessing. It's the outflowing of God's mercy and grace. So favor actually tells us more, um, tells us something about who God is and his posture towards us as recipients of grace. God says of himself to Moses, he says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. This is the favor of God. This is what Jubilee looks like. It's grace and compassion, love and forgiveness and salvation. And Jubilee, this incredible community remembrance and expression, ensures that no one, not a single person, regardless of what mess they've gotten themselves into or to whom they've become indebted, no one is left out of the favor they get to be brought back into oneness and community with God and one another. Now, right around the time of Jesus, the expectations around the, this final fulfillment of Jubilee were actually at their height. There's little evidence that the 50-year Jubilee was ever actually practiced by the nation of Israel. But the year of the Lord's favor for them became this incredible end of times vision of full restoration from exile, freedom from all political oppression. And it summed up their hope for the kingdom of God that the Messiah would usher in. And here Jesus was, right in their midst, telling them that he was the fulfillment. But it was not going to look like what they were expecting. And the scope of it was so much more than they had been anticipating and how the favor of God was not just for Israel. It was beyond their wildest imaginations. So what does it look like then? What does the favor of God look like? What do we see in Jesus, in his life and in his ministry? Well, I think the favor of God does two things that are really, really important. One, it brings dignity and two, it brings purpose. God favored Israel to restore humanity to the world, to be a blessing and show the nations around them how to care for the poor and care for the outsider, how to care for widows and orphans. This is all wrapped up in their law. But over and over again in their history, we see a breakdown of this in the community through systems of injustice, heavy religious burden, through othering, and the very ones who God favored to bring honor and to recognize worth and value end up being the ones who reject and shun and avoid and place people on the margins, even or especially within their own community. But now we have Christ. And Ephesians tells us that in Christ, the dividing walls of hostility between Jew and Gentile, Gentile being anyone who's not Jewish, that wall is brought down. And in him, there's a new kind of humanity, a new way of being. And through the same spirit that anointed Christ to fulfill this jubilee vision, this kingdom vision, the church, too, becomes the fulfillment of what Israel's role in the world was. So we're favored, given mercy and grace to restore humanity to the world, for the poor, for the outsider, for those on the margins. But just like Israel, we too see a breakdown of this, don't we? Instead of being a part of the sacred work of restoring one another's humanity, we dehumanize. And so if we think back over the last few weeks what, uh, of sermons and going through this um, passage in Luke, what did we see happen? Well, the poor stay poor. And the resource rich find themselves trapped in relational poverty. 
Captives stay captive, and the captors themselves become captive, confined in prisons of their own making. The blind stay blind, and those able to see remain in spiritual darkness, deceived and discouraged and despairing with distorted lenses. The oppressed stay oppressed, and the oppressors too are crushed and made small and broken and unable to breathe because of the systems of oppression that they have given themselves to. That's our condition apart from Christ. That's what we, the mess we get ourselves into. But the favor of God, the tangible evidence of God's approval and blessing, which is the outflowing of God's mercy and grace, says over all this through Christ that the captors and the oppressors and the rulers of this world no longer hold power. This is Colossians 1. This is good news for those who feel cast aside or abandoned or diminished. And if that's you, there are moments when it's me, you need to know that Jesus has not left you alone and powerless. This is also good news for the captors and the oppressors because guilt and shame and the forces that that have us clinging to control, they no longer get to hold power. Jesus restored the dignity of humanity by refusing the ways of violence and vengeance and in faithfulness relentlessly took up the cause of the poor and the captive and the blind and the oppressed. He came to free us from the powers of death and grave, all the things that keep us and keep others out of community and living in darkness, that keep us bowing to things that crush us and imprison us. He came to bring us back into flourishing communion and harmony with ourselves, with one another, with creation, and with God. So the favor of God brings us dignity, restores dignity. It also brings purpose. The scripture that Jesus read that day in the synagogue was Isaiah 61, but there were other passages in Isaiah familiar to the Jewish people that informed their kingdom vision of what ultimate jubilee would look like and how Messiah would come, even though they didn't always get it. They definitely didn't get it when Jesus was walking among them. In Isaiah 42, it says, I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. What Jesus came to fulfill was not the way of vengeance. Jesus did not come to cry out and shout and raise his voice, judgment, judgment like sometimes we see happening around us, we're guilty of ourselves. Jesus did not come to call out, but he, he came to call in. So how does he bring forth justice? Well, in faithfulness. How does he establish justice? By taking care of bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. Israel imagined justice as the crushing of their enemies, and instead Jesus came to relentlessly establish justice through the way of suffering. If we go down to verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Does that sound familiar? (laughs) He has rescued and favored us with wave after wave of mercy and grace to share in the kingdom of light and life that we would bring jubilee to creation and we would open eyes and free captives and release those who sit in darkness. We never, ever have to question again what our purpose is or second guess what God wants us to do. In every moment, we are to be like Jesus, to give favor to the broken, be unrelenting against oppressors, 
who seek to steal, kill, and destroy. And no matter who we are, because of the Spirit, we get to participate. It is our purpose, our destiny, to be image bearers of a God of abundant love. So what is the good news for you today? Receiving and accepting favor, dignity, and purpose has long been a struggle for me. In my life, the favor of God was all at the same time something I longed for, but also something I felt I had to earn. And other times when it was extended to me, I'd been conditioned to reject it and push it away, convinced that my job as a good Christian was to make myself little and less and small, be more humble, invite more suffering, keep my head down, careful to not think too highly of myself. And this was absolutely a twisting of religion and a deception that took deep root in my heart and made me all of the things, captive, oppressed, blind to joy, and poor in spirit. But the good news is that Jesus found me. He relentlessly pursued me. And he gently helped me and continues to help me. This is ongoing. This is this week. To disentangle my heart and my mind and my spirit from all of the lies that have kept me from being me. Kept me from believing that I am truly loved and delighted in, apart from what I do. That has been the work of, of the spirit in confession and forgiveness and giving up control. This is hard work, but it's not the work of just having more faith or believing harder that I'm loved. Today, Jesus is pursuing you too. He has reversed the conditions of slavery and oppression in our lives and in your life. He's done it already. He's done it. And he's inviting you to embrace the reality. He's ended our seasons of wandering and captivity and exile like Israel. And now we get to just be and to live in the year of Jubilee. We get to live in the year of Jubilee. We don't have to wait. You get to just be. You get to be who you are. Not on the basis of what others expect from you or what the economy or the government wants from you or what religion demands of you or how your past or your family of origin has defined you. The favor of God is on you. It is yours. God sees you. He wants you. He is glad you exist. So much so that he sent Jesus to come and rescue you from everything that stands in opposition to you knowing your dignity and worth and purpose. Because you are favored, you get to be human. You get to be in community. You get to experience the fruit of the Spirit and participate in the wonderful calling of extending favor to others. We're all included in the year of the Lord's favor. It's for now and it's forever. And it's far greater than all we could ask or imagine. And that is good news. In a moment, we're going to bear witness to a number of stories of release, freedom, salvation, forgiveness, stepping into the Lord's favor as people enter the literal waters and waves of mercy and grace. I'm going to invite those who are getting baptized to make your way to the back. As we bear witness, we get to be reminded of the favor of God on us, and we get to celebrate the favor of God on them. Their, st their stories are going to bring Jubilee to life <laughs> for us and remind us of the joy we get to live into. But before they come, before we get there, we're going to come to the table together. So I invite you to grab your elements. There's some at the tables in the middle if you haven't had a chance to grab one yet. At the table, we remember the gospel week after week. We remember that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ is reigning, and Christ will come again. 
we participate in our very own jubilee practice. Invites us to relinquish our messes and to live in the land with each other in a state of favor. So today we're going to take the bread. We're going to remember the body of Christ that was broken for us. Let's break it together. His body that was bruised and crushed so that we don't have to be. So let's make this exchange together. Let's eat and remember. I'm just going to pray for a moment. Jesus, the invitation sits before us. We heard lots of good news, lots of invitation, but we don't want to run past it. We want to receive it fully. So just invite your spirit to come. Would you speak to each heart here? God, would you show us um, where we need dignity, where we need purpose? What is it that we need from you? Come speak into our hearts now. When we come to the cup, this cup, Jesus said it was the new covenant made in my blood. And it actually represents the movement into the year of Jubilee, into the new humanity and the new way of being. It's poured out for us. We get swept up in it. It fills us to overflowing. So let's drink and remember together. All right, well, let's celebrate some baptisms now and some Jubilee stories. We are going to, yeah, our team's coming out, and um, those who are getting baptized are going to come and share their stories with us. <laughs> 